Well, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Holland Lecture, uh, named after Sid Holland. Here you see a picture of, of Dr. Holland, who was a neurosurgeon at Mount Sinai. Um, it was this was established by Lila Holland Green um, to foster the memory of Sid Holland, who was a neurosurgeon. Uh, who also did aneurysms. And in those days, uh, in the 70s, uh, that was really more uh, the way things were done rather than to be a vascular surgeon. Um, and the Holland Greens uh, sponsored this lectureship uh, beginning in um, 1985 uh, with Gazi Yassergill. Uh, this was then rekindled when Dr. Post became chair um, uh, with the next lecturer, Dr. Hopkin, uh, Dr. Flam. And then you can see the list of people focusing on vascular. Uh, Dr. Spetzler gave this lecture in 1995. And you see a list here of recognizable people, um, many of them who have gone on to uh, fame and glory and have had a big impact on uh, neurosurgery, vascular neurosurgery in particular. And this year it is a huge pleasure, honor, um, and uh, I just wanna say a pleasure actually to have Michael Lawton here. Uh, as, as I mentioned recently, both Jay and I had the privilege of visiting the Barrow uh, to give grand rounds and we got a taste of what Michael is doing with that institution. Um, you probably don't need me to say it, but he's a world renowned neurosurgeon. Um, he's done a lot of surgery. <clears throat> he is a tireless worker, uh, incredibly productive and creative. Uh, a, uh, you know, and yet someone who is willing to take advice and seeks advice from people above him, below him, and beside him. Uh, recently, he has moved from UCSF um, and he's become president and CEO, chair of the department, um, chief of his services um, and chair and president of Barrow Brain and Spine. Um, his pathway to get there was, I don't wanna say straight and narrow, but it was really, really fast. And uh, it was clear from the moment anyone would meet him that he had a bright, bright future ahead of him. So uh, it's our pleasure to introduce you and to have you with us, Michael. Um, I understand that you're gonna be talking on your bypasses today. So welcome. Thank you, Josh. Let me go into uh, screen share mode. Share this and play. Hopefully now you can see my title slide. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for allowing me to be your Holland lecture. Um, it's a real honor. Um, I was reading a little bit about uh, Sid and his uh, career. I think um, by now everybody in this country knows Elmhurst Hospital and uh, that has uh, acquired some newfound significance. And, uh, you know, I um, also feel really con more connected than ever to Mount Sinai, um, having had both you, Josh, and Jay uh, as grand round speakers this year at the BNI. Um, I had my first vascular fellow uh, at the BNI come from Mount Sinai. Um, I've sent students to you as residents, um, and I just feel like um, you know, we are becoming tightly connected. And uh, my hat's off to you, Josh, for your leadership. I've marveled at the growth and success of the program. Uh, and I think that's in large part due to you and uh, your leadership there. Well, um, let me just uh, get started. I'm gonna talk about bypasses. Um, and um, I always um, hesitate a little bit to talk about something that's so esoteric and so um, narrow in its uh, relevance to neurosurgeons. Um, but I'd like you to kind of think of this talk, maybe less so much about bypasses per se, but just about um, innovation and the process of um, how we go about and practice our craft. 
Um, that's really the message here is to think about how you wanna go out, particularly the residents and uh, the younger neurosurgeons, how you wanna go out and um, evolve yourself, evolve your practice and make a contribution. That's really what this talk is about, not so much the stitch work. So um, I always start with numbers because um, I like to put everything in some kind of perspective. And I think you can see here that I've been blessed uh, not only by the opportunity to do a lot of vascular cases, but by the opportunity to be really focused in what I've done. Um, this is um, my practice and it's been largely vascular. Um, and so it's really given me an opportunity to think through a lot of these problems, be really laser focused and not get too distracted by other things. Um, one of the things that troubled me uh, recently uh, was that, um, you know, when I thought about my aneurysm practice, it felt really secure, but, um, and that's what you see on the left curve. But if you look carefully on the right, what you see is that the, um, the curve uh, reaches a peak and starts to decline. And that's a, a worrisome trend for someone who's uh, in the prime of career and seeing his numbers decline. Uh, you know, you, you scratch your head and wonder how can that be uh, when I continue to work hard and continue to publish and, and so forth. Well, I think we're just face, facing a tremendous competition um, and augmentation from the endovascular world. And, um, and it's changed the way we, um, we are in our um, practicing vascular neurosurgery. So as I saw our specialty sort of uh, declining in some ways, I, I felt the need to to write, um, not that I enjoyed writing. It's something that, um, as you can see from this slide, is not uh, always enjoyable. It's isolating, it's introspective, it's um, difficult work, but um, the beauty of it is that it allows you to um, gather your thoughts, be creative and uh, express ideas and concepts that might uh, have relevance. And I have uh, come to this quote, the pen is mightier than the scalpel, uh, to say to you all, um, particularly the residents that, um, as you go out and, and build your practice, um, it's not enough to do good work. Uh, you can wield a scalpel beautifully, but if you don't let the world know what you're doing and um, how you're bringing your own personal flair to your work, then um, it's unknown. And so you really need to um, also write. Um, I wrote these books um, as a response to that declining trend. Uh, this feeling like, you know, we've got to capture what we've learned before it vanishes on us. And so um, part of my motivation to write my seven series was to capture this um, uh, so that posterity would have some record of what I've done, what Dr. Spetzler taught me and what others have uh, taught me. Um, and the book, uh, the first book was about um, aneurysm, simple aneurysm surgery. And it was for the seven common aneurysms. And I felt like if, um, if we could at least really master these seven, then, that would account for three quarters of all the things that we see. And um, more importantly, I wanted to try and like take an operation and really simplify it and choreograph it as we would a dance. You can't really get on the dance floor and expect to look great. You have to not only uh, understand the moves and really have that clear in your head, but you have to practice. And so the dance uh, metaphor really worked for the book and you can see how something as simple as splitting a fissure could be choreographed into these uh, steps. And I think it would, uh, was a nice way to convey this idea of breaking down what we do into these careful steps. Um, not only splitting the fissure, but even as you approach an aneurysm and you're facing those moves, you really have to um, know exactly what uh, step you take next and in what sequence. So that was the idea of seven aneurysms, but you know, um, as we think about the complicated aneurysms, um, and that's really where practices lead. You get, I get bored with the simple stuff and I like to continue to uh, push myself. And so things like giant aneurysms become a fascination. Um, and as I think about um, these lesions, um, you realize they're, they're not the same. And I just wanna show you um, this video as an example. This is a dolicoectatic middle cerebral aneurysm. I did a picket fence clip reconstruction, which you can see here looks quite good, but here's the follow-up. You can see that when you use um, the, uh, are you seeing the video by the way? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, as you look at the base of this thing, you see that that tissue I used um, was 
dis dysplastic and the aneurysm occurred. So I needed to put a high flow bypass in and you can see I've moved one trunk off the aneurysm and over to the other trunk in order to distally occlude this thing. And so um, this is what I call the middle communicating artery. There is no middle communicating artery, but with a bypass technique, you can create an analogous communicating artery like you would for an ACOM or a PCOM. So here now is the, the operative video. You can see the external carotid artery. I love these aortic punches that make a nice hole in the artery so that you can um, not only make a, a good donor site, but have uh, this wide um, piece of vessel wall taken out uh, to, uh, to increase the flow. Now here, we're back in the sylvian fissure. This is the temporal trunk off of the backside of this aneurysm. And you can see this radial artery graft going right into this uh, temporal uh, trunk as the recipient. So normally after you complete this bypass, the trunk becomes a dead end and you simply occlude it. But if you, if you occlude it and then use it as a new donor, you can see here that by transecting it off of the aneurysm, it now becomes a live donor. And you can move that over to the other trunk on the frontal side. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the essentially a reimplantation of that temporal trunk onto the frontal trunk. There's a, a look at the inside of the lumen of the first suture line. Here's the completed anastomosis. So you see two anastomoses right next to one another, which create this middle communicating. It's essentially a communicating artery that joins all of the middle cerebral vessels together so that that high flow graft can now feed everything in the territory. So here's the icy green. You can see that middle communicating artery. Here's the uh, occluded aneurysm, and you can see the flow over there on the right. So um, what that case shows you, I think, is that when it comes to giant aneurysms, they're not like uh, regular aneurysms, that they're a completely different entity, and we can't really think of them in the same way that we think of a PCOM or a small ACOM that's amenable to clipping. We have to think of a different treatment strategy. And that's where uh, we get into this whole bypass lecture. Um, you can see from the numbers here, um, uh, about 5% of my total aneurysm numbers or po uh, population is giant. And if you look at the numbers of bypasses for giant aneurysms, it's approaching 50%. And so that's why um, it's relevant. I think for whenever you get into the, the territory of a complex or giant aneurysm, you need to start transitioning from a clipping mentality to a bypass mentality. And so that was, uh, again, uh, what drove me to write this book. Um, um, I think there were a number of things that were needed in this space. Uh, the first was to develop um, a system of symbols and translations uh, so that we could innovate and we could um, uh, come up with these ideas and have a way to communicate them. I also wanted to develop a taxonomy for bypasses. Um, and, and most importantly, I wanted to um, advance intracranial to intracranial techniques, uh, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But um, back to metaphors, just as the first book had dancing as its metaphor, uh, the metaphor for this was architecture. And the reason I say this is that um, this is a view from one of my uh, many morning jogs in San Francisco where I live for 20 years. And uh, when you get down to Kirby Cove here, right on the bay, you look back on the skyline, you see that beautiful bridge. And um, when you ponder the Golden Gate Bridge, it's just an incredible uh, wonder. It was the largest suspension bridge at its time. Uh, it's about uh, 1.7 miles from one end to the other. It uh, is a susp suspension bridge that has about 80 tons of steel hanging from those very thin, barely visible cables. And it's uh, the, the miles of cable that run from one side to the next is about 81,000. Uh, so it's incredible, uh, the, the marvel of, uh, of this, this engineering feat. And it's simply a bridge. And yet the designers of this wanted to make a statement about what could be spanned and how it could look. Um, I think the same is true in New York. You all look at this incredible building every day. I had the opportunity to visit it myself uh, two months ago. And um, this is not just an office building. It has become a symbol of American resilience after 9-11. We look around the world, we see um, Antoni Godi's uh, Basilica La Familia in, in Barcelona. And you see the incredible columns, uh, these branch columns. And what struck me most was how he deliberately chose the parabola 
as his form for the, uh, the, the ceiling work. It was no longer um, a circular structure that he wanted. He wanted to be different and he built in these parabolas, which were these unusual shapes. And you can see how beautiful the effect is here. And if we look to Australia, the uh, Utsan work at the Sydney Opera House, these shells of concrete that he uh, used to create the illusion of sails and the uh, illusion of a, a ship on the sea here with these pylons built out onto the water. Um, and one of my favorites, Frank Gehry, this is the museum in Bilbao, Spain, the, the way that he uses these forms and these materials. These are all examples of architects that didn't just build what they needed to create. They made a statement about their work. And um, I think bypass is one of those uh, opportunities that we have as neurosurgeons to do the same. You know, we can express ourselves, we can be creative about how we build these things, but also express a little personality and our passion for our work and um, push, the, uh, push the boundary a bit. So I, uh, my, my slogan is from plumbing to art. It's taking something that is mundane uh, and just revascularizing the brain to uh, turning it into an artistic expression. Now, um, one of the things that also um, I thought a lot about was um, uh, how architects do this. You know, if, if our metaphor is architecture and we really think about how an architect works, he creates a vision and um, he then has to translate that vision into a series of blueprints for the, for the, uh, the builder. And um, this is my house in, in Paradise Valley. Um, and you can see that that vision from the architect translated perfectly to uh, the house and um, uh, they, they built us a beautiful place to live. Um, but what um, made the difference was the, the blueprints, the vision of the architect and the ability to translate it. And I think um, when one ponders bypasses, we really, we had no, we had no blueprint uh, system. And so one of the things in the book is just about blueprints and about uh, having a language that we can use to communicate uh, all of the ideas, all of the, uh, the landscape that we work in. On the right, you see the different territories, the vascular territories and the ACA, the MCA, the PICA and the basal. Um, and yet on the left, we need these symbols to represent our anastomoses. We need symbols to represent our graphs, we need symbols to represent what we do to the aneurysm. And this then allows us to um, communicate, whether it's to our residents, to our uh, nurses and scrub uh, uh, team, uh, whoever it is, it's, it's important that everybody understand what's needed. Now, uh, here's what we've um, just put in place. Uh, this is a, um, an app that uh, should be ready for consumption uh, any day now, but um, this is to, you know, if you have an idea, you can go to this app and you can essentially use these symbols. And um, it's our attempt to do this computer assisted design or CAD drawing that you see in, in architecture. And you can go and you can, you can build a little diagram that uh, represents your bypass. If you have some wild idea uh, that's never been done before, you can go sketch it out. And at the end of the day, um, you, you have this, um, uh, this schematic that you can share with your team and uh, you can pass it along and they can um, um, understand exactly what your plan is for the case. So um, anyway, that's coming out uh, in, a, in a paper very soon. Um, but that's a very visual way to communicate just as a blueprint is a very visual way to communicate. Um, I, I started thinking about this from more of a computer science point of view and how we can essentially code for bypasses. Sometimes actually drawing it out is, is not so easy to do, whereas a code could be much simpler. So one of the things that we've worked at uh, for years now was to develop this code. And um, you know, first we had to finish off Al Roten's nomenclature. Um, he had a nice system for the cerebral vessels um, it, with this alphanumeric system. We extended it to the cerebellum and uh, created um, essentially a code for all segments anywhere in the head. And so that's what you see in this paper and in this table. And um, when you then put that together um, in a new way of uh, describing code, um, you really come up with something. If you think about, let's say an STAMCA bypass, that really doesn't tell you much about the bypass that you're gonna do. And yet everybody refers to these as STAMCAs or uh, an STAMCA. Uh, what, what you really need if you're gonna have 
an informative code is something that tells you all of these other pieces of information, like the side, the precise segment, um, how exactly you're going to join the donor and the recipient. Um, are there any technical um, details like interrupted or continuous suture technique or an interluminal suture technique? And, and how are you going to represent the anastomosis? Well, we brought all of this together in this formula here. And so an SDA MCA bypass is really no longer just that. It becomes, you know, first a, a left STA um, uh, M4 bypass. And then you need to specify uh, exactly how you put your donor and recipient together. And so uh, for a very complicated bypass like this one here, you end up with this code that you see in the middle. And that code tells you absolutely everything you need to know. Uh, if, if you were not spoken a word or if you were not given any schematic, you would know exactly how to put this aneurysm to rest and to create this bypass just by the code. And that was the idea was to make this so that if we put this in a time capsule, if we shot this off to Mars, whoever, whatever intelligent life came upon the code, they would be able to be the surgeon. And um, I'm gonna show you this case in a minute here, but um, anyway, that's, that was the idea. Um, the seven bypasses is, is really um, a way to think about the different uh, categories of bypass. You've got um, your traditional ECIC bypasses as category one. Uh, you've got your high flow ECIC bypasses as uh, your second generation. Um, the third generation bypasses are the next four and those essentially are the intracranial to intracranial bypasses. And we're talking about reimplantations. We're talking about in situ, side to side bypasses. We're talking reanastomosis, which are end to end resplicings of arteries. And finally, uh, the intracranial to intracranial uh, interpositional bypass or the jump grafts. The seventh category, um, which I thought was a stretch just to get to seven, but it in fact turns out to be the largest of all of the categories apart from number one uh, are these combinations which are any um, multiple anytime you need to do uh, more than one bypass is it requires a combination and it could be any combination of the above so one of the things too that uh, was important to me was to really um, make this algorithmic so that um, these these complex decisions could be uniform and so first um, when I think about uh, MC aneurysms, um, it's not enough just to call it an MCA. You have to you know, know whether it's a pre-bifurcation or bifurcation or a post-bifurcation. If it's post-bifurcation, you need to know whether it's sylvian, insular, or opercular. And um, that classification is important because as you can see here, it then uh, creates different types of choices as you work through uh, how to make your decision. Uh, on the top uh, of the table, you can see the different um, aneurysm classification. And on the uh, left, you can see the seven bypasses. And depending upon which column you land in, you're gonna have different choices as far as what, uh, what options to do. And, um, and, and this table is a way to kind of summarize that. We also, um, I also put together these algorithms which ask some important questions and help guide you through that decision process. But at the end of the day, this is really about um, making the right choice. So for this aneurysm here, you can see, um, this is the one I showed you earlier with the code. Uh, you can see that um, this is a very complicated aneurysm. It's one of those um, that doesn't uh, lend itself to a simple clipping technique. So you have to you know, split the fissure, expose these trunks. Um, here's the temporal trunk over on your right side and on the left side, you can see the frontal trunk. And for this one, I'm gonna use the A1 as my donor. I'm gonna keep this all intracranial and it's still gonna be a high flow because I'm plugging in just adjacent to the carotid terminus. So I have an incredible blast of flow that's gonna provide the, uh, the donor for this. Um, I'm gonna show you a lot of videos in this talk. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast through some of these sequences here. This is just the sequence as we complete the um, sewing of the uh, radial artery graft to the uh, A1. And now we're back in the Sylvian fissure. You're looking at the frontal division here. And this is gonna be a um, side to side anastomosis. And this will have some relevance for us later, but um, it's a reimplantation really. You're taking the M2 off of the aneurysm and you're reimplanting it to the graft. But instead of um, your traditional end to side, what you're seeing here is a side to side. 
So uh, there are two linear arteriotomies. Um, the stitch here is gonna join the, um, the graft here. Actually, this is, um, I misspoke. This is not radial artery, this is saphenous vein because this guy had um, tremendous atherosclerotic disease in his uh, radial arteries, so we couldn't use that. But you can see here, this is the uh, saphenous vein joining the uh, frontal trunk, that inside wall. So this is like an in situ bypass, uh, but it's a reimplantation. And so this takes care of our um, frontal division. And then I'm gonna jump ahead here um, to show you the completed reimplantation there. We take our clips off. And now we're going over to the other side, the temporal trunk. The saphenous vein has been trimmed. So this is a short uh, jump graft. And you can see I'm using an in situ technique, meaning I'm sewing inside both lumens of both arteries to, uh, so that I don't have to move the artery much and I can keep it short. And uh, you can see that this completes our bypass. I'll jump ahead again. And now um, we confirm flow in the graft. So there's good flow. We can now isolate the aneurysm here with uh, trapping clips. And uh, here it's been trapped. You can see it's completely dead. You can suction that down. And um, actually the uh, motors dropped as I was doing that. Uh, which meant that I had not uh, taken care of these two lenticular strides. They were included um, within my trapping clips, but here you can see they've been liberated and uh, now his uh, motors are fine. And so this was that, um, that coded bypass that I showed you. And uh, here's his post-operative angiogram. So um, that's um, kind of the, the concepts that I wanted to convey. Um, you know, um, um, when we talk about innovation, it's very easy to think about innovation uh, requiring a device or a new contraption. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about from here forward doesn't involve new devices or new contraptions. So in my mind, it doesn't always feel like innovation. But um, I think the idea or the um, point I want to make here is that um, innovation isn't about the device. It's not about um, uh, the, the new uh, contraption that you're bringing into the world sometimes. Sometimes it's just about how you're using old techniques in novel ways. And that's really what um, the rest of this is about, is how something as antiquated as an astomosis that was introduced over a century ago uh, is just you know, being applied here in ways that haven't been done before or are different in some way. And so that's um, what I consider to be the innovation here and how uh, I view this as an opportunity to evolve the craft. So these are the points uh, I'm gonna talk about. I'll start with the ICA bypass. And when I wrote seven bypasses, I didn't talk about ICA bypasses. I talked about um, bypasses in the MCA territory, in the ACA territory, at the basilar apex and in, in the PICA territory. Um, but um, as I finished the book, I thought, well, if, um, if this framework has value, then I should be able to apply this other places like ICA. And so here are the seven bypasses in the ICA territory. Um, and I set out to try and do all of these. And uh, you can see the illustration here shows you them. Um, these were the traditional spaces, the MCA, the ACA, the basilar apex and PICA. Um, but here um, uh, I was going into a new territory. This is now just to introduce this idea, this is a, a thrombotic ICA aneurysm. It was compressing this lady's uh, pons. She was developing symptoms from that. And this is actually Justin Masatelli, uh, one of your graduates. Uh, he's exploring here the uh, vertebral artery, the lower cranial nerves. And um, he called me up. He said, you know, there's no pica. We can't do your pica ICA bypass that you were hoping to do. But as it turns out, um, uh, I was able to find pica. It was a little further downstream. There it is. Uh, and so there's pica and ICA coming together uh, side by side. And so pica uh, becomes a donor for us to use for ICA. And so um, you can see how by mobilizing them together, we can make our two linear arteriotomies, one in uh, ICA here, which will be our recipient. And the next uh, will be in uh, uh, pica. Uh, and this stitch will join the two and uh, the idea here is if we use uh, pica to donate to ICA, we can then trap this aneurysm and do a thrombectomy decompression and relieve the, uh, the brainstem uh, 
compression that this lady is uh, suffering from. So here's some of that uh, stitch work here. This is a side to side anastomosis. Um, I'll just accelerate this. This is the intraluminal suture line. This is now the extraluminal suture line. And um, as this uh, finishes up here, you see we now have a communication between the two and um, our clips can come off. We have nice flow. And now we can turn our attention really to the, um, to the aneurysm, which is up in this corner here. Uh, the, the bypass is low. As we turn uh, our attention up higher, you can see Ica coming out of this aneurysm. The sixth nerve here is draped over the uh, origin of Ica from the aneurysm. This first clip is closing Ica as it exits. Now we go medial. And as we look um, over the seventh and eighth nerve bundle into the prepontine cistern here, you're gonna see the basilar trunk right in here. There'll be just enough ica here uh, to apply a proximal uh, trapping clip. You'll see it right there. There's that little segment there that we can put a clip on. Now the aneurysm is completely uh, excluded. And now we can um, go inside the aneurysm. We can do a thrombectomy uh, to decompress it. And that's really what this lady needed. She needed a um, thrombectomy to relieve the mass effect on her brainstem. And um, you can see here with the CUSA, we can rapidly decompress that. Um, there's a nice view inside the aneurysm as the thrombus is broken apart. And here is an overview at the end. You, you're gonna see in a moment the icy green that shows the bypass here, retrograde filling up to the trapping clips up here, and our excluded aneurysm is up there. So there you see our bypass in action. And uh, this lady did uh, really well. Here's her post-operative angiogram and a uh, good result. Here's another of the ICA aneurysms. I'll just briefly show you this one. It's a mycotic uh, fusiform aneurysm that presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, you can see here um, the uh, subarachnoid blood. The aneurysm is this dysmorphic infectious thing here. We're gonna excise it. We're gonna completely remove it. And, you know, this is a very deep bypass. You can see this is the seventh and eighth nerve. This is the lower cranial nerve bundle down here. We're literally uh, right on top of the sixth nerve, which is deep to this area where I'm working. Uh, but you can see that the um, ends of the artery have enough redundancy to come together very nicely. The aneurysm rolls out of there and we can sew in a very deep, dark uh, hole here and uh, we can get this together. Here is uh, the um, stitches going in. I'm showing this just to show you um, the depths that we can, we can do these complex ICIC reconstructions here. This is literally um, uh, at the sixth nerve, which is almost to the midline. And so um, here we're at the end, the clips come off, the bypass uh, uh, looks good, a little fibrillar to get the hemostasis going. And uh, we have a nice bypass. There's the sixth nerve right there. Seven and eight is here. And here's our IC green showing good reconstitution of that, uh, that ICA. And here's her post-op angiogram. You can see in here where the aneurysm used to be that we have a nice normal reconstructed artery. And this lady who was uh, really hard hit by her subarachnoid hemorrhage actually uh, recovered beautifully. Now um, that's ICA. Um, those are rare. You're not gonna see a lot of those, but you may see more of these. These are the uh, anterocerebral artery aneurysms. And this is a paper that uh, I published uh, with Adib back in um, 2015. Uh, we looked at um, 16 years worth of ACA bypasses and only came up with 10 of them. Um, and they're shown here. Um, in the years since then, um, uh, these were the, all the bypasses that uh, were done. There were 13 more since that first publication. And this table just shows you the uh, spectrum of new or variations of those different bypasses. The variations included in situ bypasses. So not just doing your traditional A3, A3 bypass, but um, bringing the colossal marginal arteries together, bringing the pericolosal arteries together, doing them both in combination or mixing them. Uh, here, examples of here, the colossal marginal to colossal marginal bypass. Here's an example of an A3 to colossal marginal that uses their kind of latitude where they come together easiest, not so much their symmetry in the segments, but their, their proximity and bringing those two together. 
uh, the reimplantation techniques. I, I had only done uh, maybe one in the earlier series, but here uh, experimented with different types of uh, reimplantations from, uh, from the uh, pericolosals from one side to the other, using colossal marginals from both sides, uh, crossing the singular gyrus to go colossal marginal to pericolosal. These are all variations of reimplantation technique, and this is what uh, those look like. Um, the A1 as a donor vessel, I've shown you that in that earlier uh, video, uh, but that has become a real workhorse. That is a, a beautiful donor site because um, when you think about the ACOM, it gets you through any ischemic windows and you've got uh, uh, that tolerance to that uh, clamp time. And also you've got this carotid artery that plugs literally right, uh, uh, it feeds that donor site. So it's a really robust uh, donor. So um, I'm gonna skip this video and show you this one here. This is an example of how we can use these uh, interposition graphs. This is a giant ACOM. I did this uh, a few weeks ago, uh, very thrombotic. If you look um, at this. Um, Subtraction, angiogram, and 3D reconstructed. Sorry. Uh, th this is the uh, uh, angiogram that shows you a very small lumen just to make the point that this is a largely thrombotic aneurysm. Um, so we have to, if we're gonna fix this with a bypass, we're gonna to have to deconstruct that ACOM anatomy and then reconstruct it. So we first have to um, put in uh, an inflow bypass um, with an A1. Um, uh, we have to replace the A1 and that's gonna be an M2 to A2 bypass. We also have to replace the ACOM, which is our communication portion of the anatomy. And that's gonna be an A3, A3 in situ bypass distally in the fissure. And, um, and then we have to do our, um, our, uh, uh, our uh, trapping procedure. So here's the schematic that we uh, produced from our little app. You can see the code up at the top. So we're gonna go M2 uh, side to end uh, with a continuous suture. We, we'll use a radial artery graph. The other anastomosis on the other end is end to side. Uh, the, um, uh, Asterisk denotes this uh, intraluminal suture technique. Uh, and then we're gonna do a combination bypass. That's where the plus comes in. And we'll, we're gonna throw in this side to side A3, A3 bypass. So there you have the code, you have the schematic, you have a picture and uh, here's the video. So this is now uh, the view of the Sylvian Fisher. This is gonna be a combination of both a um, terional uh, uh, exposure and a bifrontal all in the same skin incision. This is that bifrontal window. We've got to be able to come down into the interhemispheric fissure and get to the uh, A3 vessels. That's what you're seeing here. So uh, these are our A3s. They uh, come together very nicely. We do our linear arteriotomies. You're getting familiar with this view, but these, this is that interluminal suture line uh, which uh, brings the A3 uh, deep wall together. That has to be done intraluminally uh, with continuous suture. This is now the extraluminal suture line, also continuous to make things fast. And that uh, takes care of our ACOM. This is our reconstructed ACOM. We just moved it from in front of the aneurysm to behind the aneurysm. And uh, here you see uh, the icy green showing good flow. Now we uh, go down to the ACOM, and here is uh, the A1 coming in. This is the A2 coming out. I contemplated bringing these two together, but um, things uh, didn't quite come together uh, enough. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, do my jump graph. This is the um, recipient site on the A2. Here's our arteriotomy in the A2 segment. Radial artery now is uh, being brought down and this is gonna be a fish mouth end to side, which you can see here. I'm gonna um, jump ahead here. This is just the sewing uh, of the different walls here. And uh, so now we've completed that um, deep anastomosis to the A2. Now we're in back in the Sylvian fissure. This is the middle cerebral bifurcation. This is gonna be our donor site. This is the end of the radial artery graft. And once again, I've uh, got the graft positioned so that I'm sewing intraluminally on both sides, graft and M2. 
This makes it uh, so that you can really trim down the graft and keep it nice and tight. There's a view of the deep suture line. And now we can just uh, bring that other wall over the top. Here's the uh, stitch work. The um, Sylvian Fisher is really a, a joy to sew in, particularly after being down in the, uh, in the uh, carotid cistern there at the A2. But you can see here, this is now uh, finishing up the graft. And um, there, uh, there's the completed anastomosis. Clips come off. And now to, um, to finish off the aneurysm, what we're gonna do here, we're gonna close the inflow here on the A1, which is what you're seeing here. And uh, we're not gonna completely trap the aneurysm because otherwise we would, we would exclude the perforators and the recurrent arteries within the clips. So what we're gonna do here is just close, the, um, close off the aneurysm to the inflow from the bypass graft. So this is what this A2 clip is doing. So this is redirecting flow up the A2. It communicates through our A3, A3 bypass and then goes around the horn to get to all the perforators. And when you look at the IC green, what confirms that that circuit is, is intact is you're seeing the recurrent artery of Huebner here filling in between. The only way that can fill is if the circuit goes around the top through our two bypasses and around. And so that confirms that we've um, uh, re-engineered that circuit and uh, that everything works well. And when we look at our angiogram here, you can see that. Here's our short jump graft. You can see the inner or the um, uh, insight to uh, A3, A3 bypass here. And you can see the flow all the way down to the ACOM. Aneurysm is completely thrombosed off and we had good uh, preservation of perforators and Huebner's at the base there. So that's a, uh, an example of a, um, uh, in the classification, it's this type six, <clears throat> uh, what the sixth generation, it's a third generation bypass, that's number six in the, uh, in the um, um, seven bypass scheme. Uh, here's an example of another one of these combination bypasses, what I call the azagus bypass. It's a jump graft from the A2 around a complex uh, aneurysm here and uh, reconnecting to both colossal marginal and pericolosal. So you can see here so many different ways to uh, reconstruct that territory. These are the um, different uh, schematics that we did in that second series of ACA bypasses here as compared to the first and really just an endless variety. So um, I'm gonna finish with this uh, idea of the fourth generation bypass, which um, <clears throat> for those in the um, audience who uh, do a lot of pipeline work would, would argue that the fourth generation bypass is really the, uh, the flow diverter, not any of this stuff that I'm talking to you about. But I'm gonna go back to that, um, one of the first cases I showed you. That was that giant MCA. And <clears throat> if you think about that case, that reimplantation that we did of this frontal division here, it wasn't your typical reimplantation. It's normally an end to side anastomosis, but we did that reimplantation with the side to side. So when you look at this from that video, there's our side to side anastomosis, and here's our completed connection here. Also, when you think about the other end of that graft, I sewed that end to side, so that's your more typical reimplantation, but I did it with an in situ technique. I sewed inside the arteries to do that deep suture line. And you could ask yourself, is that really an end to side or is that a side to side? Well, the fourth generation is really um, wrestling with these issues. It's basically taking um, in that latter case, a conventional construct when you sew it with an unconventional technique, meaning this in situ technique, then you're doing something a little different. It's not your traditional third generation bypass, it becomes this fourth generation bypass. The other variation, that side to side, um, is an example of an unconventional construct for a reimplantation, but using conventional techniques. So that's what I would call a 4B. And um, I'll just show you some examples of that in a minute. But um, when, when you think about that, you then explode our chart here. You can take the seven bypasses that we've talked about, but you can introduce these fourth generation variations that open up different ways of bringing these vessels together. So you can see that we, we're expanding our horizon. We're not just limiting ourselves to simple reimplantations or simple reanastomoses, but 
we're opening the door to uh, different ways of doing that. So um, here's an illustration of that to hopefully make the point. If we're gonna do a reanastomosis, the typical third generation way to do that would be to excise the aneurysm and bring the ends together with an end-to-end. -end. But if we um, sew those end-to-end -end using an intraluminal technique, it becomes a foray. Or if we use different anastomoses here to do our reanastomosis, we have options that are 4Bs. So uh, here's an example of that. This is a, a, a pica. You can see uh, the vertebral artery is here. This is a, a rupture case. Uh, the uh, aneurysm is here. And there are uh, many perforators that are really uh, all over this segment. So for me to bring this end over to this end here with a, a classic end to side would have disrupted those perforators. So we can do our reanastomosis with a different anastomosis. So it becomes a, a 4B and we're gonna do an end to side anastomosis rather than an end-to-end, -end, and we're just going to do it a little bit further downstream. So you can see how those vessels come together really nicely, and uh, I'm going to skip all the handiwork here and take you to the end where, you know, we've, we've brought this end-to-side anastomosis down onto the distal pica here. So we've revascularized with a different uh, anastomosis th than we normally would, and by doing that, it allows us to keep the perforators in situ and not compromise them. So here's the flow. You can see backfilling to where the aneurysm uh, lights up here. And now we can isolate the aneurysm, but we've kept all of those perforators uh, in situ and intact. So this is an example of the type 4B using the reanastomosis uh, re uh, example. Dr. Lada, well, reimplantation is uh, You can typically do reimplantations by doing these um, uh, end to side anastomoses, taking a vessel off of an aneurysm and moving it over. Uh, you can uh, make that a 4A by sewing intraluminally uh, with still an end to side, or you can do these different forms of, uh, of uh, anastomosis. So here um, is an example of uh, another MCOM, or another middle communicating vessel. So for this one, again, we've got a dolichoectatic middle cerebral uh, aneurysm. There are two major trunks coming out of this thing. We're gonna do a double barrel bypass here. You can see each limb of the SDA is being used for each of these two trunks, the middle and the uh, uh, superior trunk. The inferior trunk is on the proximal side. Um, but then here's the key. Once those two bypasses are in place, we can bring the ends together, reimplant them to one another with this end to end. This creates our middle communicating artery here and allows us to recommunicate the flow. So um, these are just two SDA MCA double barrel bypasses. I'm gonna skip all the details there. You can see at the end, we've got a good flow, but now we go to the creation of this middle communicating artery. This is just trapping the aneurysm. These are the two bypass trunks. And now as we transect them from the aneurysm, uh, we can bring them together end to end. So here's one end here, here's the other end there, and we can join them end to end. And the reason to do this is that those two STAs were quite small relative to the recipients. And this communicating bypass allows the flow to redistribute itself throughout the MCA territory as needed. That way um, the flow will dictate uh, uh, or the, the demand will dictate the flow rather than your construct dict dictating the flow. So there's the communicating artery. You see one STA there, the other STA here, and our middle communicating vessel allows the flow to recirculate uh, as needed. And this lady uh, had a beautiful result clinically. Um, other examples, these are interpositional bypasses, again, showing how you take a type three, convert it to a 4A or a 4B, and um, uh, this one I already showed you. This was an example, actually, of a middle communicating artery. Here's another example uh, of an intracranial to intracranial middle communicating. Again, a, do a dolichoectatic uh, bifurcation aneurysm. Here you can see the anatomy. What we're going to do for this one is we're going to use the A1 as the donor for our jump graft. So the A1 here uh, becomes the donor. Uh, we'll get that uh, graft sewn into there. And then we're going to take these two trunks off of the aneurysm and we'll sew them together. We'll reimplant them to one another. So it's an end to end reimplant. 
and the graft supplies the, uh, the two trunks. So there's a view down the fissure. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead because uh, in the interest of time, you've seen all this before. But here, we have about six minutes our, left. Our bypass in place, we can cut the ends of the well. artery off of the aneurysm. We can flip the aneurysm out of our way. And then we can bring these two ends of the arteries, the two trunks, we can bring them together with this end-to-end uh, -end reimplantation. And we can sew that together. And here we are at the end. We've got our end-to-end -end reimplantation here. The radial artery graft is supplying the, uh, the M2 and uh, our icy green shows nice filling of that circuit. So there's the end-to-end -end reimplantation there at the bottom. You see a little bit of flow in the, uh, in the aneurysm here and uh, that goes on to nicely thrombose uh, over time. So that's uh, yet another example of these uh, middle communicating artery constructs. And here you can see the artist drawings here, end-to-end -end reimplantation with two double barrel bypasses here. Here's the end-to-end -end with the interposition graph. Here are our schematics. And here's how we uh, assemble code. Um, so um, I've taken you through this list. These are all examples of um, innovations in bypass surgery, uh, but the innovations can continue. Uh, you know, this is basically just a list of all of the bypasses that um, uh, I'd love to do someday. Um, I haven't done uh, these bypasses uh, or I, I've done slowly chipping away at this list, but the idea here is that, you know, the sky's the limit. Uh, the only limitation on what bypasses we can do is um, the anatomical confines that we're in and just uh, the limits of our imagination. And um, part of um, being creative is uh, getting these ideas together, going to the laboratory, um, seeing if the arteries reach, uh, trying these out on cadavers, seeing if you, you're comfortable sewing in these corridors. And um, if you feel like the answers to those questions are favorable, then you take it to the OR and you give it a shot. Um, this is a, um, uh, an example of uh, a uh, dual origin pica with an interesting aneurysm here. Uh, we use the uh, variant anatomy that um, uh, the patient had and, and use this as an internal jump graph. We cut the, um, the artery off and we swung it over. I think I have a nice animation on this to show you. Oops. Yeah, let me uh, just show you this animation. So here's that case, subarachnoid hemorrhage case. And um, when, you, when you're dealt a nice hand and you've got this extra limb, what you can do is you can uh, use it. You can trap this aneurysm. You can excise this limb off of the vertebral artery. You can swing it over to the distal pica. And rather than harvesting a graft or um, having to uh, do extra work to mobilize another donor in, you could just swing it over. And that's an endocide reimplantation. And, uh, and there you have it. Um, here's what that anatomy looks like in real life. This is one pica, here's the other pica, here's their confluence. You can see um, this was the ruptured aneurysm in this space. Um, this is a nice uh, demonstration of how I, I really like to um, first try to clip uh, and avoid a bypass, uh, but you see here the tissues are just too fragile. We've got an interoperative rupture so we are forced here to escalate to um, the bypass there. There's just a, essentially a hole where the aneurysm used to be. And now um, you can see that first limb of pica. We can cut that off of the vert. See how that nicely swings over to the distal pica. And you can see this uh, bypass just suggests itself. We can now sew this down, enticide reanastomosis. And we've got our own internal jump graft that goes around the dissecting aneurysm and reconstructs that pica flow. So um, I'm gonna skip this and finish with one last idea. Um, I've been showing you bypasses for aneurysms, uh, but you know, I, I think that we can innovate even beyond um, your traditional aneurysms. And um, uh, I'll finish with that point. Um, these dolichoectatic or tortuous Basilar trunks are great examples of how um, in our vascular realm, we get uh, these patients referred and we're asked to deal with this. And one of the things that um, I've been toying with is these macrovascular decompressions, these slings that we can create to move 
not your small ICAs and small SCAs off of the fifth nerve or the facial nerve. We're talking these dilated atherosclerotic basilar trunks that cause the same hemifacial spasm or trigeminal neuralgia symptoms, but are due to these large vessel compression syndromes. And the, the answer to these have been um, these uh, slings. So um, you can see here uh, what that sling looks like. The, the, the way I like to do it is to make um, a, a loop with a slit. You can feed the tail of the sling through the slit so that you're working with just one tail. You can use um, a little puncture site in the clival dura to uh, bring this down towards the clivus. And I like to use an aneurysm clip because it'll, it'll tack things nicely and also allows you to uh, fine tune or adjust the tension on the sling. And that's a really nice way to move the vessels. Well, that has nothing to do with bypass, um, but the idea is the same. Here's an example of that same pathology. You see this incredibly redundant vertebrobasilar system and it's, it's compressing the, uh, the seventh and eighth nerve complex. This patient's symptoms were essentially a compression syndrome from this tortuosity, but um, there's just too much artery to do that sling that I just showed you. So that's where the bypass comes in. We're gonna do a, um, a bypass here that essentially reroutes the vertebral artery. This is the V4 segment that you're seeing. You can see that if I could pull it forward and hold it there, that might work. It gets it off the nerve, but there's just so much artery there that instead of that, I'm gonna actually transect the artery. I'm gonna reroute it lateral to the nerves, and then I'm gonna put them back together again. So this is basically using bypass techniques to do a macrovascular decompression. And that's the idea here. There's our transection. You can see how when they run inside the nerve, they're compressive. When you reroute them outside of the nerve, they no longer are compressive. The nerve now can lie in its normal position. We can reconstruct the vascular anatomy now on the outside of the nerve bundle here. And again, this is the same techniques that you've been seeing. This is actually a type 4A because we are doing an end-to-end -end reanastomosis, but we're using an intraluminal technique here. So um, uh, that's what uh, this deep suture line is. It is a deep hole and it's uh, some tough tissues here because they're so atherosclerotic that you can see here, uh, they come together nicely. I'll jump ahead to the end. So here's our reconstructed V4 segment. It's now lateral to the seventh and eighth nerve. He no longer has any uh, facial nerve compression uh, and uh, he, he, his symptoms resolved as soon as he woke up from his surgery. And uh, you know, in this particular case, the, um, the anatomy was so tortuous that the contralateral vert supplied the basilar as we were doing that anastomosis. So uh, the tolerance was quite good. You can see as you look at his post-operative films, the anatomy, or I should say the pathology looks almost identical, but because we've rerouted things lateral to the nerves, we've removed all of that vascular compression. So um, I am going to jump now to my concluding slide here, uh, which you can see here. So um, this whole talk has been about um, uh, really uh, a message, and that is the constructive power of simple suture and the importance of manual craftsmanship. You know, th this talk is about innovation, but you can see there's no high tech here. There's no robot, there's no uh, fancy device. It's just the same simple instruments that you have on, on the shelf, that we all have on the shelf. And it's how we use them, how we apply our minds and uh, use these uh, other tools, these concept tools, to, uh, to push the envelope. That's really the message here. And um, you know, the other message here is that um, it, it, it's tough work. I, I don't wanna mislead anyone into thinking that this is easy. Um, you know, it takes a lot of um, uh, what I call hands, head and heart. You've gotta work on your hands, your dexterity, the technical skills that go into these procedures. You've gotta um, think of the strategy, be creative and uh, really think through how you're gonna recreate this uh, the solution to the problem. And then finally, the heart, you know, the, these are really um, difficult cases. You have your complications, your bypasses may not, may not fly, and you really have to be resilient and, uh, and stay with it. So um, that's it. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, run through all of this. It's a lot of um, uh, the ways that I think about bypasses. They're um, 
really some important lessons there. Um, uh, I, I hope that you think about these intracranial techniques because I think this is where we can push the bypass envelope. And um, you know, it's it's one of my favorite operations. I uh, enjoy it immensely, and uh, you know, it really represents to me why um, vascular neurosurgery is, is so exciting. So uh, I will sign off with that. Let me unshare here. Michael, don't unshare that last slide. That. Uh... That is the top of the bobcat trail. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, uh, that represents the best part of the best run in the Marin Headlands, I think. And the slide before that, um, if you don't mind showing, can yeah. you just back to that last slide? That's Justin Mesatelli there uh, on the there right. And uh, you know, Justin was an outstanding chief resident. I remember what he said uh, when uh, he did that. Uh, you showed one of the cases, one of the one of the really cool cases. Maybe it was the Ica bypass or something. Uh, he called me after that, and uh, he was just marveling at how much fun it was, how much creativity you were bringing to it, and how far you were pushing the envelope, which you have proven really beautifully in this talk. 